Welcome to the Jersey City War D debate. I'm Pat O'Melia, the host of the Jersey City Show, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. We have all four candidates from War D. Let me give you the uh, rundown. Each candidate will get a two-minute and two-minute opening and a two-minute closing remarks. They will get two minutes to answer questions. There can be rebuttal. They can go at each other. I will control the time on that. Uh, we'll take an intermission somewhere around 7.45. Let me introduce the candidates, starting with Rafael Torres, Mo Kinberg, the incumbent Ward D. Councilman Michael Yoon, and Carmen Beggar, way at the back there. Hello, welcome everyone. Tell us a little about yourselves before we get to the questions, Rafael. Yes, thank you, Pat. Um, my name is Rafael Torres. I'm a retired Jersey City firefighter a lifelong resident with over 30 years in the Heights. I married two children, age 10 and 17 years old. I'm also currently the Jersey City Puerto Rican Day Parade Committee Vice President. And I just wanted to say to the people in Puerto Rico, uh, to those in need, uh, to the Americans in need, uh, that help is on its way and uh, we hope you get uh, health and redemption as quickly as you can. But I'm, 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 I'm very eager to be uh, here to answer the questions and, and get a little interaction of what the people of the Heights want. Thank you. Mo Kinberg. Oh, good evening. Thank you, Pat. Uh, my name is Mo Kinberg, and I'm running for city council here in uh, Ward D. For as long as I've been in the Heights, I've been involved in my community, whether it's the Riverview Farmers Market or Clean Streets Initiatives or working on parking solutions. I've dedicated my residence in the Heights to community involvement. Frankly, I've been doing a lot of what an active city council person should be doing. I've gotten stop signs installed and uh, potholes filled and you know street cleanups. But after the election last November, I realized that I needed to do more than being an active community member. I needed to work in government from within. So I launched my campaign last January with the support of my neighbors, who are also vo my volunteer campaign team. And a few months ago, the mayor asked me to join his ticket. I took a hard look at his record and what this administration has done, and I saw an administration that was able to invest in our parks and our streets and our communities without raising taxes, and I wanted to be a partner in that progress. So I think many people in the Heights have similar reasons for living here, but not everyone has the same reason for staying here. And I have an investment in this community. Um, it's more than about property or business interests for me. Um, I share an investment with my husband. Her name is Myra and she's 14 months old. And I'm gonna do everything I can to make this community the best place it can be. So I hope one day when she's old enough to be able to tell her that her mom ran for office because she cared about the future of her community. I'm here and I'm here to stay, and I'm not gonna start, stop working so, till we make the Heights a better place than it was yesterday. So I hope I can count on your vote on November 7th, and I'm really looking forward to this debate. Michael. Good evening, George City Heights. This is Council Michael Yoon, and uh, uh, I saw in it uh, uh, July 1st, 2013, since that I tried to take care of that the issue we face in George City Heights, and not only that, also George City itself. And the first things I do that, you know, Georgia City Heights, we have a serious problems of parking policy have to be changed. As you know, I called it there for public meeting and for online service, and we set up the uh, parking review committee, Georgia City Heights. Actually, Mo Kimbo is one of the committee members, and they, they have come up plans. It's four hours parking zone plan. Actually, there we city council passed that. They're going to start in first May first, two thousand eighteen. Not only that, I fight for as council person unnecessary long-term tax abatement because that long-term tax abatement actually helped the developer, but also it's a hurt the regular taxpayer in Georgia City. So I fight for that at the, over the years, in the four years. Not only that, clean street. If you come up the Union City, clean street. But if you come up the Patterson Prank Road, Georgia City hype is like a landfill. So what I do, fight for make more clean street in Georgia City hype. As you know that, Union City spent $2.5 million. They populated Georgia City four times more, and the land-wide, we are 14 times larger than uh, Union City, but we only spent $300,000. 2016, we able to increase a half a million dollars. Today, 2017, I fight for that. I increased the uh, budget is $1.2 million 
on seasonal employee. I try to make sure that our streets are clean. Not only that, mass transportation, this is another issue, because a lot of people move from the New York City to Joy City, hope keep the Joy City high because of that environment is good compared to any other place. Not only that, Joy City has provided mass transportation. Before Joy City High, only have a daytime service in New York City. Now we work with the community and the uh, government, what we able to do that 24 days service, six days a week. So this is improved mass transportation. Also open space planning. And open space is very important to the people of Georgia City High. And uh, we will do that, $700,000 uh, uh, mosquito park, and the uh, reservoir three three hundred thousand dollars person field eight hundred thousand dollars and the one point two two million dollars uh, 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 gazebo in the Riverview and eight hundred thousand Riverview Park and also we print the eight hundred thousand dollars person field racetrack I pay concentrate open space but still we are long way to go so that's why I run for again to try to finish on business yep. in Georgia City High. Okay, Mike. You this went a little long on that, but let's get calm. Yeah, Here, she's in this too. Common. Hi, I'm Common Vega. Thank you for having me here this evening. I moved to Georgia City after being, I was born in Puerto Rico and lived here all my, my whole life. I raised, I'm, I raised three children here in Georgia City, and I owned a small business in the Georgia City Heights, where I lived for, seven, I, I, I lived for 17 years. I'm running because so many of people have grew up here and cannot afford to live here anymore in the Jersey City. We can do a better job. We need to require developers to build more affordable housing to extend rent controls laws, keep our streets clean and safe. Also, we need to embrace community parking, policing, complete plans to make the reservoir a natural oasis and world class park. That's it? Oh, I was going to check my email. All right, that okay. takes care of the opening statements. Raphael, you said you're a former Jersey City firefighter for 30 years? Yes, I did. How long you lived in Jersey City? I lived all my life, except for the time when I was in the um, United States Air Force. Well, that counts. You're still here. Uh, I'm, I'm here all my life also. That's true. You, you Mo, how long have you been in Jersey City? Eight years. Eight years. Michael, how long you been in Jersey City? Well, 37 years. 37 and Carmen? Yes. 17 years in Jersey 17? City Heights, but I lived all my life here. Since I was a baby. Well, I'm lifelong in Jersey City, life 39 long. years up in the height. Mm -hmm. First question, nice, easy one. What do you think about our elections being in November now, our municipal ones? Are you satisfied with that? Yes, for me? Yep. Yes, Pat, thank you. Uh, yes, I am. I actually advocated for it. I came out with some posters. You might have seen it in Stop and Shop where I said, say yes uh, to November voting. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why I, I, I agree with this and, and the reason why I support it is that it's inclusive. It, it, it gets everyone to come out at a best time that you can get the vote. So why not accept it? Why not, you know, support it? Well, you probably don't watch my show then. Mo, uh -huh. November election? Well, I think that I'm going to have to agree with uh, Raphael and say that, you know, I think this is an opportunity to get as many people out and um, engaged as possible. And I'm very interested in having a high turnout in the Heights. We want to make sure that people are exercising their right in this democracy. And this is a good opportunity to get people out um, and to get involved. And so I think in this, this year with the November election, I think we're going to have a really good turnout. I think we're going to get a lot more people. And I think that's going to be um, good for this election and good for our democracy. But I do want to just touch on a few points that Michael made during his opening statements. Because um, a lot of the things that he's talking about in terms of clean streets and the parking initiatives is work that community members have been doing. And Michael has a history of taking credit for other people's work. And so I just want to make it clear that, you know, those are initiatives that he had a part in, um, but he needs to recognize the work that other people are doing as well. And he's, you know, he's absent sometimes when the work's being done, but he's perfectly happy to take a victory lap when the success happens. Well, that should be interesting. Mike, November elections, and I know you want to rebut that a little bit. Go well, ahead. I'm going to touch on that issue later on. <laughs> November is the election. Actually, I'm against it. People don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand the fact what we're going to be in November election. If you know that, if it's Georgia City election, if we start in May, and we can have a runoff in June. But now what happened, people's loan, we plus 50% plus one vote we require. So most cases, Georgia City election go runoff. Runoff will be December, Thanksgiving, Christmas shopping. So turnout, they talk about it, but turnout is going to be very low as a runoff because we all know that most case, 
a lot of people will go run off. Probably one, two people, other than one, two people, rest of people go run off. And actually, it's going to be turnout is going to be very, very low. Maybe 5%, 10%, 20%, they will decide who will be next uh, elect officer. So it's a very dangerous idea. And when they change in May to November, that's one reason they have that. One person's a political ambition, nothing more than that. They're not, they're not saved any taxpayers' dollars. They say they're going to save a half a million dollars. That's not the truth. I'm going to make sure that, that everybody knows that they have no money saved, but a very inconvenience. So we know that that's the one of the reason I against that. And also another reason is that if we see November election, their ballot is a very, very crowd. If we see this year, governors, state senators, and the freeholder, uh, board of it, and also Jersey mayor and uh, Jersey council, and the uh, referendum. And also uh, uh, November election is a party election mixed with a non-party election. So it's going to be very confused. Everybody, when you go to the uh, voting place, they have to put GPS in their finger to find the right person to do that. But don't worry. Michael Yoon is the right person for World D. Carmen, November election. I say no also. I think it really is going to affect a lot of people. People are not going to come out and vote. People definitely, I, I mean, I feel that May should have been better because it's true now there's, there's so many races going on the governor and this other. So we definitely, I mean, I feel the same way as Michael Young. It should have been in May because definitely it's going to go into December. It's a holiday and people definitely not going to come out and vote. All right, Michael, we'll start this next round with you. Sure. Parking. Parking, yes. Parking. Uh, the Jersey City Heights Parking Committee just had an ordinance passed that will sunrise, I believe, in May for 24 hour enforcement in the Jersey City Heights. Yes. What's your opinion on that? Well, you believe or not, when I campaigning, when I go to Western Slope, every part of the Jersey City Heights, number one issue is parking. When the people pay $15,000 tax, and they're not able to have a parking space, they're very upset about that. But we have to understand, downtown is a parking also difficult, and the height is difficult. But the difference is that if we go downtown, parking is difficult, but they have a space available if we're willing to pay, pay $20, $30 an hour. But Georgia City Heights, even though you want to pay, but they have no space. So what I find out as a full public meeting and the full as online service, we got to have to have a policy. Actual time, we got to make Joyce High as one zone. That's why we try to do that. And we make a plans. I make a presentation at the 2014 January and Nelson Avenue Block Association meeting. At the time, actually, people are not ready to do that. And I'm going to tell the, that public meeting. We have an eyewitness at the time, Guy John. He's attended. He's attended here, too. He wear that. Actually, that's the reason we stopped that, because people are not ready to take change of policy. But after that, we turned to the, actually, we set up the committee, Joyce Parking, Joyce Height Parking Review Policy Committee. Actually, I said Mo is one of the person. And they come up plan, they come up plans, exactly same plans, what I have in 2014. So now, when the community leaders put it together and when they support the plans, what I have in 2014, yes, that's the way it started. That's the only just the beginning of to solve the problem Joyce Height. That's a short-term plan, but mid-term plan, what we have to do, we have to build up the change zoning issue because of setback issue. When I build it, every two brand new houses in Jersey Heights must have to provide four parking space. Other than that, we're going to have problem. Long-term issue, long-term long, long -term solution, what we have to, we have to create the space. Doesn't matter what they say, doesn't matter what kind of policy we put in, we have to create space. Common. There's definitely no parking at all in the Jersey City Heights or Jersey City. It's getting very difficult to live here. Um, we definitely need to, um, I think a zoning is coming on May 2018. It definitely is going to help out um, the community. The people need to, they need their parking space. And they keep building and building, but there's no parking. I feel that um, if they build, they should be able to have, especially a 12 family and up, they should be able to have parking, under, underground parking for these tenants that they Raphael? Yes, um, this is an important subject, especially in the Heights. We seem to get a lot of cars. Uh, but I don't think uh, it was that important uh, to put $15 a year on. I, I think it should be half that much. Um, and the reason why is that uh, you have alternate 
side of the street parking, which alleviates uh, a little bit of the problem. If they try to park the car overnight, uh, they're going to eventually get tickets. But we should have a, a limited zone parking for the reason um, that we have a new facility that's being built off of Central Avenue. Uh, so in order to use that facility overnight, you should have somewhat of a zone parking permit uh, to do so. Uh, the councilman ha has, has mentioned uh, just uh, if you just heard uh, a meeting, a, a public meeting that uh, was called the Western Slope Community Meeting, and, and, and that was back in April. And, and it's ironic that he spoke about it and he's boasting about it uh, because he pulled the ordinance from the table. After these three meetings, he will pull uh, after hearing the public actually talk about this. And, and the inclement weather is the reason why this was brought up. Uh, if you remember, we had two storms, and the storms uh, made Bowers and the Western Slopes a little hard to get around. And these uh, streets are two ways, and they should be one way. So he did not support that uh, and pulled, after wasting the time of the city, he pulled the ordinance. And, and I, I would not take that approach. As councilperson, I will make sure that that's fixed that this is addressed and that our time is not wasted uh, for an ordinance to get pulled because of certain people uh, went to his place and, and, and said they didn't like it. Uh, Mo, you're, you're chomping at the bit. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, so, I mean, I don't think it's hard to find out that parking is a major concern in the Heights. If you go and you talk to your neighbors, um, if you go door to door, you find out that parking is a major concern. Uh, as a committee person, I did that. I went door to door in my neighborhood and I found uh, that people kept on talking about parking. So I brought that to a forum of community leaders and one of those people um, said that she wanted to do a forum on parking. So we, with, um, we together did a forum on parking at the Heights Hope Community Coalition meeting and we brought together policy challenges and solutions. And it was an array of different ideas on what could be done about parking in the Heights. A residential zone was one of those ideas. Um, that's an idea that's been going around. Michael may have come up with that idea, um, but we had it on, the, on this presentation. And then we started meeting after that forum. And the residential zone was one of the top things that people wanted to work on. So we focused on that. And we engaged the council person because that's what you do when you want to get policy done. You work with the leaders in your community. You work with the council person. So we did that. We worked with Michael Young, but we had meetings monthly. I had meetings with a six month, a six week old baby um, strapped to me uh, because I was committed to work on this issue because we had started something and so we were gonna finish it. So we had monthly meetings, countless meetings. We wrote out the policy, we brought it to the council, we met with the other council people to make our argument for that policy. We brought out people to the council meeting uh, who spoke in favor of that. We did all the, that organizing. I was a major player in that organizing. I do take offense to Michael taking credit for my work. It is offensive. Um, and we passed the parking ordinance. Michael introduced it. Um, you know, that, that's, that's what happened. And I think it's something that will improve the heights. It's a residential zone for all of the heights because people do ha have parking issues with people who are um, you know, out of the city parking here, especially since Union City now has a residential zone for their area. So if you live on the border like I do, um, you know, people from Union City are sometimes parking in our area, and so this will alleviate that. It will help us get an idea of how many cars we have in our neighborhood and what the situation is. It's not going to solve the problem, but I think it's a good starting point to get a handle on the problem. All right. Following up on that, the parking ordinance that sunrises in May is a 24-hour ordinance. So we have to enforce 24 hours. We wouldn't put an ordinance on the books if we couldn't enforce it. The parking enforcement division doesn't work 24 hours a day. So there's a cost that's going to be associated with that. The next question we have is on finances, but before we get to it, how are we going to pay for the 24-hour enforcement? And since you're looking at me, Mo, I'll let you go. go ahead. Well, I think there's some things. I mean, I think what this ordinance does is it forces parking enforcement to be modernized. Right now, we're, the way that we're enforcing parking is not in a very modern way, and there's a lot of efficiencies that can happen if we modernize our parking enforcement. So I think that's going to play a, a huge role um, in a, you know, the budget issue that may incur. We're also not talking necessarily about um, you know, the way that they can enforce it can start in um, doing it in a spot 
a spot way where they're doing trouble areas, uh, knowing where there are trouble areas within the heights to, to get that 24 hour enforcement. It's really up to parking enforcement to figure this out, but we did meet with them and they said that they agreed with it and they'd be able to enact it. So we trust them to be able to do that. And we know that it's not gonna happen, even though it's overnight, it's not necessarily gonna happen overnight, but they will implement it over time. Um, and that's, and it, but it's pushing them to modernize, to be more efficient, and to you know, meet the needs of our community. What was the price they quoted for the 24-hour enforcement just for the heights? Uh, they did not quote a price to me. Well, you got PEOs, two shift supervisors. Actually, that price is in the millions. It depends on how they're that. going to enforce it. How do you pay that? You're going to have to pay for it in tickets. And that's, I, I'm in favor of the audience. Just a 24-hour enforcement that we can't do. Mike, you want to say something about the 24-hour Yes, enforcement? yes. Before we talk about 24-hour service, you know, I hope it's, uh, you know, whoever watched these things, I mean, that, that uh, this show I have to understand. I don't want to fight with uh, where the credit belongs. It's like a baby, so I don't want to talk about that. But I'm going to make sure that this was true. 1999, that's the first time in Georgia City created a municipal parking lot behind the Burger King, 150 space. And the Congress and Central Avenue, 20 parking space creative. You know what, how they created that one? I fight for that. I'm going to make sure that everybody wear that. And we have eyewitness over here, Pat, who is a moderator of this uh, uh, forum. He will know that too. Because why? Without creating the parking space, we cannot solve the problem. Let me tell you one more thing. 1999, when I worked with the city, we just built up the 150 parking space behind the Burger King. Actually, one of the two third of the parking space was empty. But as a leader, I have to plan for the future. So what happened today? If we go behind the bulky parking lot now, it's a parking lot as a fool. Then what that means in leader is a leader of people for the future. And I did that. Now, you want to know that yeah, how are we going to be funding for enforcement 24 hours of parking space? That's a tough one. I'm telling you. If we go downtown, there were seven different parking zones. And the major complaint with the downtown people, why they not enforce? That's the problem. Even though we're going to be 24 hours of parking plan in the Joy Street Heights, yes, that's a big challenge to enforcement. But I'm going to expect whoever be elected mayor 2017, I want you to make sure that enforce that the rules of what we set up by city council. Carmen? It just well, needs to be more enforced. What enforcement is not going to work out the 24 hours because you need revenue, you need money. So most likely they have to give out tickets to have revenue to come in to actually pay the workers. So I feel, um, for me, it will be also to have a, um, a parking lot. We definitely need a parking lot. I think that also will help out with the issues in Jersey City that has to do with parking. And the only way we're going to enforce it, they got to work 24 hours. If not, it's not going to work out. Raphael? The yes, uh, you think with $15 uh, there will be enforcement per person, per car. Um, the councilman, uh, Michael Jung, mentioned uh, also a few times about parking per house, which I, which I really think is an, it's, it's not a reality. Um, to have four spots when in reality we have just too many cars in, in the Heights. I feel that the enforcement part working with the police department already could start out a little bit better because if it takes $15 for an overnight, um, then how much would it cost if we could just get half a day? Because I don't really see police officers uh, and parking authority actively giving out tickets in areas where I live. Uh, remember, Jersey City is a, a mostly a one and two family house uh, residential mostly area. There are problem areas, but that stems from Central Avenue. And there are pro problem areas in, on the Palisades, but they're, they're isolated. Uh, there are also multi-jurisdiction areas uh, that on Kennedy Boulevard that the county or the sheriffs, excuse me, uh, have jurisdiction over. So getting back at the table and after the Pulaski Skyway and Route 139 is done and, and, and over with, I like to, to talk uh, as council person to get some of their uh, readjustments and still keep this as a seven to eight dollar range, uh, not worrying about what's happening because once the Pulaski Skyway and the 139 uh, traffic is alleviated, we might not have this parking problem. Once the parking facility is built, we may not have this. Uh, money from that parking lot shouldn't certainly go for the payment of, of maintaining uh, and giving out tickets.
What parking facility are you referring to? Uh, there's a facility with, uh, that's owned by the parking authority that's the parking lot behind Burger King that's going to be built uh, into a parking facility. Well, there's going to be residential development there. Uh, well, there's no, yeah, uh, a with, parking with, facility with parking that's introduced. On the ground floor. I don't think you, have you heard about it? I uh, think uh, the mayor. The mayor, yeah, the mayor yeah. has talked about residential development. No, no, the mayor has something on the table, and I thought it was further than, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's going to be about. residential development on top of a parking lot, but you got to keep in mind, the residents But there's a, a multi-parking available. Uh, the rest of the project, yes. Uh, I'm just talking about the parking facility available to the residents of, of Central Avenue, or, I mean, excuse me, to the parking uh, of residential uh, that's behind Burger King. That's going to be a multi, if it's a residential on top, I didn't look that far into it, but it could be so. That's the deal. Now, the Burger King, a lot across from the North Precinct, that's where the new North is allegedly going to be built, and you lose that parking also. Okay. Now, before we go to finances, I want to remind people, North Bergen, which is a postage stamp size of Jersey City, has way more municipal lots than we do. The city's been selling off our municipal lots, see, and somebody point. needs to press the mayor into reinvesting that money into more municipal lots. Carmen is right. We need more lots. We need Pat, more lots. Pat is to say right, actually. Georgia City, since this administration moved in, they sold a lot of municipal lot. I can say that. You know, actually, previous administration started from the Bright Chandler. He continued to create a municipal parking lot. I'm sorry, was there a question that was asked? Yeah, well, no. you just so you're just allowing oh, okay. uh, finances. Let me get to uh, that. I just I try to make sure that people should get you know, fully informed there for the voters. have it the All right. time that well, we're supposed listen, to have. This is right in your wheelhouse here, uh, Michael. Finances. <laughs> the city of Jersey City's budget. It had gone up approximately $100 million under the administration of Steve Fulop. I believe it's $97 million, but for symmetry, we'll go with $100 million. Uh, that's $25 million a year. With that, a tax hike, except for the first year, I believe it went up 8%. Is that sustainable? And how was it accomplished? You see, Raphael. So, hold on, hold on. Uh, Raphael, all right, go ahead. Okay. Calm down. Yeah. Well, yeah, like Raph, how is that accomplished? Is it sustainable? $25 million a year every year. Um, being sustainable is one thing. Um, on a subject that I would rather take full responsibility as council person, um, I, I, I really think um, I, I really have to look at making sure that I do it right. So I, I would rather not answer that for the sake of making sure that, um, that I, as a council person, uh, will look at the budget. I really think that uh, the current mayor has been transparent on putting that budget online, and that's what I like to see and continue. My vote would not be a rubber stamp vote. Um, I would honestly look at each and every line by line, just like Michael Jung. And, and don't forget, I, I volunteer 10 hours a week, over 1,000 hours uh, for two and a half years with Michael Jung. I know how good he is with numbers. But numbers is just one ninth, in this case, of the subject. And my strength would be in affordable housing, which would have to do with taxes. So I would look at that very strongly. My also, my other views would be redevelopment plans that would cost money. Uh, and I would look at the money to allocate and find different ways for allocating that money in ways that probably you never saw, like the Liberty Science Center, the way they got a public school out of nothing. Um, and that, those are the things we like to see that would offset any of the money uh, on my desk, and I would have the opportunity as a council person to do that. Carmen, $25 million a year for the last four years. That's sustainable. How is it done without a tax increase? Well, first of all, we need affordable housing. Definitely, that's one thing. We definitely need affordable housing. It could be used for affordable housing and definitely throughout the city and residents. Definitely need to, we need affordable housing definitely for our residents. Right now, they're really suffering. They cannot afford to live here anymore in Jersey City and they want to move out. And that will be their voice. I want them to stay in Jersey City, the Jersey City Heights. Mo? 
Well, I mean, I think every year we're going to be looking at the budget and making sure that we balance the budget and that we're not increasing taxes. And we've been able to do that over the last four years, and I think that's great. We've been able to invest in parks. We've been able to invest in our communities. We've been able to do um, you know, homeless shelter for veterans and, and build affordable housing. We've been able to do all these things over the last four years with the leadership of Mayor Fulop, and I think that we can continue to do that um, same thing. If we elect Mayor Fulop again, I think it's going to be um, you know, we have tactics in place and we are a growing city and we are going to be able to continue to balance our budget and invest in the things that are important to our communities. I also believe that we should have a more transparent process for budgeting and open up that budget process to the community and educate people out where we're spending money and get feedback from them on how they want to see that money spent. I think we do need to be more, I think we could definitely um, have a transparent budget process and that's something that I would want to do and be part of. Michael, how well, has that done for the last four years? See, this is very interesting. 2013, when they, uh, uh, Steve Flo take out government, actually, his administration, at the time, his budget is $485 million. And uh, today, it's $595 million, almost increased $100 million. But we have to know the truth. Over the four years, Mayor Steve Flo issued a bond, borrowed money from the worst, almost $100 million. And the, let me tell you one more thing. Land, to, land sale to the Georgia City Medical Center, 2.25 acres, $24 million. Also, he get the JCMUA. They have a surplus, $31 million. He took the money, put it in the Georgia City as a general budget. And not only that, 2013, he increased 8%. In other words, they get to collect more $16 million from the taxpayer. So we got to understand, yes, he able to tax stabilize that because he borrowed a lot of money and he used the money JCM is supposed to be used for infrastructure improvement. He used it at Georgia City as a general fund. So all those things will be come out 2018. We have to be understand. And also another one, he was lucky as Count, uh, Mayor Stevens was lucky because our economy was up. So a lot of revenue is something we're not expecting. Like uh, we get uh, some $700,000 Airbnb. And we get collect some hotel tax more than before. We get the construction fee more than before. Those kinds of things have helped a little bit. But we have to understand, we have almost $700 million outstanding bonding. And we pay almost $70 million pay bond every year, principal interest. So we got to have to be more conservative play. The uh, I mean, budget is a safe, them, safe for the taxpayer them, the way we spend the money now. And we got to understand, government require a balanced budget, okay? So it doesn't have to be still full of the budget, uh, balanced budget. No, does the government require a balanced budget, not because of him. All right, we'll have another question before the intermission. This is the reval. The reval numbers should be out in November. Conveniently after the election, by the way, but it'll be out in November, but before the runoffs. The revals are going to be devastating for the long-time property owners, the mom-and-pop homeowners of the Jersey City Heights. As a city and as a council person, how are you going to protect mom-and-pop, and in particular, the seniors and the disabled for not being chased out of their homes? I will go with Raphael. Thank you, sir. Um, well, of course, this is a, a big problem, and the residual uh, but the lack of taking care of it in the past has also been an accumulated problem for us. And, and for this administration, uh, they must be having a hard time now that they have to face. Um, it failed from the beginning, but it's a, a necessity. I think I, what I would do as a council person would right away is, is make sure a watchdog uh, community is formed, oversee that watchdog community here in the Heights and see what it means to us, to the Heights, and if I could reach out to the committee members, even if I do uh, become council person, I would like that in my arsenal. And if we could take on line by line exactly what they need, and in this case, for example, um, as they go in the house, we have to make sure that they, there's communication, there's gonna be problems of uh, being that I'm Spanish descent, I, I will make sure that that is overseen. Um, the problems actually going in the house has been a, a, a lifelong problem with one and two family houses. Uh, anything bef after three families, 
they shouldn't be a problem because of the, the management uh, that's usually set up in these buildings. Uh, what I like to see uh, is to offset that and make sure that if there is a big difference in payment, that it's done uh, accumulatively and, and done little by little, and that, that the poor people uh, that have to suddenly pay a little bit more may not have to do that all at once. Uh, that's another concern. The other concern is as they do um, their inspections, why not just take care of a few other things, um, like, like making sure that the houses and the inside of the house um, and that it's inspected and if there's any problems, that that is also communicated with the task agencies that the mayor or the RRC agencies that the mayor currently has. Uh, right, I really think that this is going to be a problem. You're out of time. Mo, go ahead. Roll with it. Yeah. I agree. I think we absolutely need to protect the most vulnerable people in our community. We need to make sure that seniors, that low-income families um, are protected throughout the reval process and make sure that they have the resources that they need in order to um, like the senior freeze. Anything that we could do, any programs that are available, we need to make sure that people know about them. We need to make sure that, that the process is transparent, people understand their rights, and they know what they can do. Um, so as a council person, I would want to be that conduit for information, making sure it gets out to the community, make sure there's forums uh, to educate the community so people know what's happening and what they can do as residents. Um, you know, I wouldn't want property owners like maybe Michael Young who own many properties to have to move out of Jersey City. So, um, you know, I want to make sure people have what they need. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Go. You know what? After I let the couch person, I always use a lot of one word that I scratch my head. And the just our person, Mo, the way she said, I scratch my head. We got to talk about the policy. Okay, city council actually invite the rebel company but I'm gonna tell that to share with everybody, I'm very, very scared. And the council candidates was when asked that the rebel company about the rebel processing. Not only that she say, downtown has a full zone area, so they, she asked that the rebel company consideration have a full zone. For the, at that time, rebel company said yes, they're gonna consider for full zone area. I was really upset. Rebel company, their job is to find the true market value. I hope they're not fixed price, artificially fixed their market value. I'm gonna make sure that. So if I elect the council person, I'm gonna keep an eye for that. I'm gonna make sure it's clear for them, everybody, where that the problem going on. And also, we did in my office, more than 100 senior to senior freeze programs. We gotta make sure that they are tax freeze now before, after rebel. And also, we gotta understand, when you do rebel, all the most homeowners get the hit very hard. But we gotta understand, 1988, Georgia City High is the number one area in citywide. So 1988, rebel, we hit most of Georgia City High. What happened? A lot of people packed out and moved out Georgia City High. Now, 2017 rebel, gonna hit the most is a downtown. Those people looking for to come up other place, probably Joy City High. So I'm gonna tell you that. First place to hit most is the downtown. Second, General Square. Third is Height. So we are much better situation in 1988. So if we're willing to sell that house, don't sell now, after rebel. There are more buyers looking for house to buy Georgia City High. So as a councilman, we can not much do about it, but what we have to do, we gotta make sure, control Georgia City's government spending, so we got to have a minimize impact to taxpayer. And also, tax abatement too. Those got the tax of the people, they're not going to nothing to we'll get to, to abatement. Risk. You're out of time. We'll get to abatement. Oh, 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 okay, we got go. time. Call All me. right, this, go. This is what you're concerned about, affordable housing, chasing people out. What do we do here? How do we protect these people with the rebel? Well, sir, that's what you want. Uh, no, we're talking to Carmine, not you. Oh, yes, definitely okay. we need to work with the residents, Carmen, especially rather. the senior citizens right now. They're, they're going to be very shocked when the rebel comes. They're not going to be able to live anymore in Jersey City. I mean, as councilwoman, definitely we'll be out there giving them information, see, finding out they need, what they need, and definitely I'm going to be working with them because I understand Jersey City has, has been very, I mean, the reval is coming, and I know that definitely the taxes are going up especially the Jersey City downtown, most likely they pay the less tax than the Jersey City Heights area. 
Well, any of the long-term homeowners who last had their home assessed in 1988 and are going to be assessed in 2017, they're going to get hurt. You're right, downtown, the Heights, Journal Square. But before we break for intermission, any city that can sustain $25 million increases on their budget should be able to protect the seniors and the disabled and hopefully the mom and pop homeowners here in Jersey City. All right, we're going to break for intermission. We'll be back in about eight to ten minutes. People have a coffee, make some phone calls. You watch what we're about to show you. We'll be right back. Burns Brothers Memorials Mon Burns Brothers Memorials Monuments and Markers 787 Tunnelly Avenue Jersey City Hudson County's only monument maker serving all faiths and cemeteries design studio and launch inventory on site cemetery inscriptions and custom orders welcome Burns Brothers Memorials Monuments and Markers 787 Tunnelly Avenue just south of Seacorkers Road craftsmanship that will last for all eternity Burns Brothers Jersey City Albert H Hopper North Arlington Visit us on the net. Consumer Carpets, 3408 Kennedy Boulevard in the Jersey City Heights. Your one-stop store for residential and commercial floor treatments. Carpeting, linoleum, tiles, laminates, hardwood floors, area rugs, remnants. All major brands, all in stock. Free estimates, same-day installation. Consumer Carpets, it's savings, selection, installation. Credit cards and debit cards accepted. Financing available. Consumer Carpets, price to fit your budget, installation to fit your schedule. On the net at ConsumerCarpets.com. Consumer Carpets, Jersey City, 201-792-2712. Good Friend Self Storage in North Bergen, New Jersey is a fully climate controlled facility equipped with state-of-the-art security, packing supplies, a refer friend program, and multiple loading docks convenient for commercial use. Located just off of Route 3 at 4301 Tunnelly Avenue, Route 1 and 9. Call 201-867-867. 2444 or visit us on the web today. Good friend self storage. Let us be your good friend. Introducing the MyJCMC app, powered by Practice Unite. 
The free MyJCMC app puts the power of healthcare at your fingertips. Go to the concierge for access to referrals, scheduling, and appointments. See emergency room wait times and get directions to Jersey City Medical Center health locations. Read the latest JCMC news through their social media feed. Find a doctor and more. The MyJCMC app. We belong to you. It takes more than a state-of-the-art medical facility to make a great hospital. It takes a team of dedicated medical professionals. That's the Jersey City Medical Center, Hudson County's number one hospital. Medical teams consisting of New Jersey's top doctors, magnet award-winning nurses, and accomplished hospital associates, all committed to your good health. That's what you have at the Jersey City Medical Center. Make Hudson County's number one hospital your first choice. Visit us on the web at BarnabasHealth.org. Meineke Car Care. Conveniently located at 700 Tunnelly Avenue, Jersey City, half a mile north of County Road. Meineke Bumper to Bumper Car Care. Brakes, exhaust, oil change, wheel alignments, batteries, CV joints, and so much more. First rate service at a price you can afford. All major cards accepted. Apply for a Meineke card. Meineke, Jersey City. Stop by and let Sammy check your brakes for free. Newport, the luxury waterfront community on the Hudson River, offers a quality of life you deserve in 10 high-rise rental towers with amenities such as the on-site Newport Path subway, light rail and ferry service, Newport Town Square, three playgrounds, dog run, upscale restaurants, retail giants like Sears, JCPenney, Macy's, and Target. Morton Williams Supermarket is just outside your front door. A health and fitness club, spa, skating rink, and medical facilities are also on site. NewportNJ.com Enjoy the New York skyline from Newport Town Square. Manhattan is just one path stop away or quick ride through the Holland Tunnel. Nursery and private elementary schools all on site. 12 screen movie theater at the Newport Center Mall. Want to visit Newport? Stay at the Western or Marriott Hotel. Go to NewportNJ.com for details. Newport has luxurious towers, great restaurants, shopping, New York skyline views, schools, playgrounds, a marina and yacht club, gym, spa, fine wine, fine living. It's incredible. It's you. NewportNJ.com. Newport. Live like you want. Pen and Pencil Properties, Jersey City. Shape in the workplace with state-of-the-art office spaces that address your company desires. Building residences that define your home environment. Adjacent to all modes of transportation with on-site parking available. The right address, the right lease. Call 201-521-521. 9000 or visit online at panapintoproperties.com. Panapinto Properties, building Jersey City for everyone. Plaza Auto Body, 700 Tunley Avenue in Jersey City, your local collision specialist. Body and fender repair, on site oven baked paintwork, fiberglass repair experts, custom and classic car restoration. All insurance is welcome. 24 hour towing available. Licensed by the state of New Jersey. Plaza Auto Body, 700 Tunley Avenue, 201-222-3050. Plaza Auto Body, your bumper-to-bumper -bumper buddy. Rama Jewelers, located in the Lyndhurst Shopping Center at 413 Valley Brook Avenue, Lyndhurst. Come for all your jeweler needs at Rama Jewelers, where you will find a fine selection of necklaces, earrings, rings, and bracelets. Choose from one of our complete sets, our many signature items, or find the perfect engagement ring. Come on down, that's Rama Jewelers at 413 Valley Brook Ave, Lindhurst. Call 201-939-5784 or visit us online today. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, Jersey City. Hudson County's only monument maker, serving all fates and cemeteries. Design studio and launch inventory on site. Cemetery inscriptions and custom orders welcome. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments, and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, just south of Seacorkers Road. Craftsmanship that will last for all eternity. Burns Brothers, Jersey City, Albert H. Hopper, North Arlington. Visit us on the net. Consumer Carpets, 3408 Kennedy Boulevard in the Jersey City Heights, your one-stop store for residential and commercial floor treatments. Carpeting, linoleum, tiles, laminates, hardwood floors, area rugs, remnants, all major brands, all in stock. Free estimates, same-day installation. Consumer Carpets, it's savings, selection, installation. Credit cards and debit cards accepted. Financing available. Consumer Carpets, price to fit your budget, installation to fit your schedule. On the net at ConsumerCarpets.com. Consumer Carpets, Jersey City, 201-792-2712.
Good Friends Self Storage in North Bergen, New Jersey is a fully climate controlled facility equipped with state of the art security, packing supplies, a refer friend program, and multiple loading docks convenient for commercial use. Located just off of Route 3 at 4301 Tunnelly Avenue, Route 1 and 9. Call 201 867 2444 or visit us on the web today. Good Friends Self Storage, let us be your good friend. Welcome back to the Jersey City Ward D Council Debate. Second half, I'm Pat O'Neill, the host of the Jersey City Show. I'm your moderator for tonight, and we'll resume our debate right now. We're gonna start with Carmen Baker. Abatements in Jersey City, Carmen. Carmen, abatements. Good, pro-abatement, anti-abatement. Did they hurt the city? Did they help the city? Uh-oh, got a whole page, go ahead. <laughs> abatements definitely to me, we need to cut back on the use of abatements because it's, to me, it's hurting the town that we, and the market's so high. So I don't understand what we're giving tax abatement for. Definitely markets are high. We don't need to give tax abatements. The purpose of tax abatement is to get developers, to encourage developers that would, that would otherwise too risky. I would like to see more in terms of the light industry jobs creating projects instead of more luxury apartments. Although my current residents can't afford. The city should cut back on long term abatements. We do need 30 years tax giveaway to get projects going on this town and they are unfair for the neighbors down the block that much higher taxes. Well, let me just round this out. You know, we started the abatements in Jersey City about 30 years ago to kickstart development basically on the waterfront. Uh, the question is, do we need abatements in downtown? Do we need them in Journal Square? Do we need them in the Heights? Do we need them in Jersey City? When does it become Jersey City location, location, and location? What do we do with abatements? Mo? So I think abatements are a tool that cities have to use to spur development in areas um, where they want to develop or to meet the priorities of that community. Um, so I think that when we're looking at abatements, we have to think about what are the things that, what are our priorities as a community? Um, where do we want to spur development? Where do we think development would be helpful? How are we creating jobs? Are these good jobs? You know, abatements often come with project labor agreements, so they're creating good jobs in communities. So I think we have to think about the things that we want in our neighborhoods. I'm definitely skeptical of a 30-year abatement, but I think we have the, the abatements are leverage that we have. So if we want to have a senior housing, affordable housing, uh, a community center to build parks, that's leverage we have to work with developers to get the things that we need in our communities. Um, so I don't think we should discount a tool that we have um, as a city to use uh, to make Jersey City the best place it can be. Raphael, abatement, yes. pro, con, what, do we, what should we do here? Yes, I, I do support abatements outside of the Golden Coast or downtown. Um, but if they are downtown, that they have very little uh, incentives. Um, outside of downtown, it's very important that because the abatements, they have an attachment uh, in order for us to give affordable housing, just like Mo was just speaking about. Um, it also has given us the opportunity to, to, to include uh, recently the diverse and inclusion uh, ordinance that went through and, and it was passed where we, we try to get 23% of the construction companies uh, to follow through. And, and what the construction companies and the unions had told me is that more building, the more we, we build, the more jobs availability, uh, the more diversity uh, now in the construction. Uh, um, and, and I just like to add on the diversity and inclusion, I, this is a new project and there's a new director. I, I think we need to give them time and we need to work with that office um, to make sure that we get the numbers that they, they, they want to get uh, for construction of these buildings. I, I think relating to these buildings and having a relationship with them uh, and with the unions is going to be my strongest tra straight, um, traits. Excuse me. Um, I, I really think abatements are important, uh, but of course, 
abatements in the heights uh, well, we have mostly residential one and two family homes. Uh, uh, the, the only thing we could do is have a councilman that's not a rubber stamp, but, but that gets something out of the deal as well. Okay, Michael. Well, tax abatement, very interesting field. If we just talk about tax itself, it takes a couple of hours, but I'm going to make it short. Problem in Georgia City, tax abatement, they're abusing the policy. They give away tax abatement, just give away like a hot candies away. This is the problem. Let me tell you this. If we get the tax abatement, they pay around 55% or 60% discount than normal tax. They not contribute any school tax. What that means is that while they not pay school tax, regular homeowners have to pay school tax. They not contribute county tax. Yes, they contribute county tax. 5% of annual service charge. Very, very minimum. Very, very minimum, very little amount, you cannot even count. But rest of things, we have to pay. That's why county taxes went up 2016, 10%, 2017, 9%, because of that. And also, tax event, when you get tax event, they not pay land tax. They pay annual service to the city of Jersey, but they deduct land tax. So while we get city of Jersey, almost nothing. So now, this is the problem. Affordable housing for tax month is a good. So that's the way we encourage the people to build affordable housing. But the way that tax went to operate in Georgia City, unnecessary. In other words, journal square, 50, 60, 70 straight building. Not only that, the, I, I understand three towers give some motivation to other developers to come in journal square. But after that, we give away more than eight different tax in that area. This is no. And the downtown, uh, I think another project called they get the 30 year tax month one of the reasons they ask to uh, build up the affordable housing unit. What are they called, the PET uh, project was that? What are they, auto Photoshop, auto shop, uh, auto pot shop, what was that? Yeah. Uh, the PET boys. Uh, PET boys, right. You know what, they put your affordable housing units, not that much, and we give them 30 years of tax abet, but we get the affordable house only 10 years. So a lot of council people vote for long-term tax abet by headline, but council and Mike Nguyen, read the content, small fine print, to make sure our we people taxpayers get protect. So what I'm saying is that long-term tax abatement about time to stop it, unnecessary one. And to make sure that Green Bill area, yes, so sometimes they deserve to, to have it. Mike, you yes. got something you want to say to him, Mo? Oh, no, I just want to make sure that you're no. keeping the time that we have Yeah, well, to... I'm not that hard on it. All right, uh, is there any, real quick, is there any part of Jersey City that should be abatement free? Is it downtown? Is it Journal Square? Where is it that we shouldn't give abatements anymore? See, my Mike, Mike, real opinion? quick, just real quick. Downtown, Journal Square. You know, even downtown, not all developers. Some area downtown need it. Not long-term tax abatement. Maybe 10 years to encourage and or depend on how much they contribute to the community. Common, any part of Jersey City? I think it's no tax abatement, period. I think tax abatement, we definitely need affordable housing. And I feel these tax abatements are definitely hurting. hurting Raf us. Raphael? Well, yeah, I, I, I would, because uh, I'm a faith-based person, um, I would look into some of the private schools um, that really need help, um, like the parochial schools, to get an incentive, uh, uh, not necessarily that they're building new facilities, but that they could get something more out of it uh, as a relationship with the city, a little Mo? help. No, I definitely think there are areas of Jersey City that we've seen have caught to the point that they don't need abatements. Um, so I think we have to take that into consideration. Um, but I also think we do need to take them on a case-by-case -case basis and make sure, like Michael Young was saying, we need to make sure we're getting what we need for our community, that the deal is a good deal. And I would definitely be very thorough at looking at those deals and making sure that we're getting the things that we need for our communities out of those tax abatements. I'll give some props to Mayor Fulop. He started attaching the affordable housing component to the abatements. So yes, Steve, I'll give you a little prop there. Nothing says the Jersey City Heights like illegal apartments. What do we do about illegal apartments? There's tax fraud involved, there's bank fraud involved, there's insurance fraud involved, there's fire issues as an ex-fireman. What do we do about this? And I'm not kidding you, these are all frauds that are committed. Nobody's telling the bank, listen, I'm, I'm mortgaging a two-family home, but it's really I'm gonna have a four. So there's a ton of frauds here. What do we do? Mo, you go first. I mean, I definitely think we, do need to you know, crack down on illegal apartments. I agree they are a fire hazard. 
um, you know, and it is you know, a tax issue as well. Um, I think we also need to address, you know, see it as a symptom to a larger problem. And the reason I think we have a lot of these illegal apartments does have to do with the lack of affordable housing that we have in our communities. So I do think it needs to be a two-pronged process. We're actually looking at how do we create more housing um, that is affordable within the Heights. And I know that's an extreme challenge, but that's something that I really want to work on. Um, so I think we have to address it in, in two ways by, you know, both cracking down on the situations that are occurring, um, at the same time, you know, making sure that we have housing for the people who live here that is affordable. Now you realize with the illegal apartments, that causes traffic problems, it taps the Jersey uh, City City services, and there's no taxes to that. And it's, it is a huge problem. Common, illegal apartments, what do we do? Enforcement. You need to enforce it. They need to be out there. The inspectors checking the buildings. If it's a two-family, you see there's an apartment in, the, in the, the bottom floor. That means it's illegal. Also, driveway is another problem. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of illegal driveway also in the Jersey City Heights. Michael, illegal apartments. Well, this is a tough issue. I hope it's a Mayor Steve Flo remember that. Actually, I discussed one of the issues that how we're going to be uh, try to control illegal apartment, not only Joy City Heights, it's citywide. One way to do that, I suggest that to him, very simple. When they have a building and or business or a house, when it's sell, the transaction come up, they need some kind of a CEO from the a building department. That's the one way to we can they limit their illegal apartment. You know. But they have an issue. We have a short of a housing issue in Joy City Heights, citywide. So that not can be answered at this point. And also, you believe on a lot of realtors against their plan because once they do that, probably all the real estate transactions will be stopped. So what we have to do, we gotta have to change something. If we have an illegal apartment, one of the issues that the Patty mentioned to that uh, fire safety issue and the traffic and the garbage issue. And those kind of homeowners have to be follow their building code. If it's a basement, if it can be Convert for apartment based on today's building code, then we gotta should we do that and they should we pay change of units instead of two units to three units and they should continue more tax the people of Georgia City, I mean the city government. So we can be made fair for that. And in the future, what we have to do, what we have to do, we have a slowdown. If we push them out now, we're gonna cause a lot of problems. And the, some people purchase house based on their income. They're supposed to not, they did that. And we're going to be able to a lot of cause problems. So finance problem, a lot of homeowners. So what we have to be, we're going to correct the problem a little slow down with a plan. And we have to build affordable housing for the mid-income and also low-income housing in Georgia City Heights. That's the way we can limit it, the uh, illegal apartment in Georgia City Heights. All right, Mike. Now, by the way, yeah. these cookie cutters, now Mo and I, we've had conversations during our parking meetings, mm -hmm. the cookie cutter houses, you realize they're actually built with the idea of what they call a bonus apartment in it. Yeah. So yeah, we're kind of complicit with the illegal apartments here in Jersey gonna, City. Well, well, I was just going to talk about that. Fire, firefighter, right. tell me about I was just going to talk apartments. about that because uh, Councilman Michael Jung, at the last debate, talked a lot about this. Talked about allocating four parking spots for cars also. Uh, for each of these new houses, which I really think is out of the park. Um, illegal housing is, is, is a problem. So if one of these houses, these new ones, let's take that for example, is 2.5 as they consider taxes. So, uh, so that's two and a half apartments, or two apartments. They get the garage, now they're parking outside. The garage is an apartment now. Uh, and I've seen a lot of this as an inspector. I was an inspector for over 15 years. Um, I was a fire official for 10 years. I did fire safety programs just on this, the families who live in these new houses, which they're paying over six hundred to eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. You would think um, they would know what to do, but my problem is this, and as the councilman alluded to, is that okay? Uh, now that we go into these and they have inspected for the revalve, say, you know, we're going to discover a lot of illegal houses, and what we have to do is. Let the mayor, as he has his task force, take care of that emergency problems when it comes to people who, for no fault of their own, are renting. Uh, and they are in the middle of this landlord frenzy uh, that they seem to be making money off of. Uh, we need to really be diligent on, on, on getting to the landlords and finding them. So enforcement is very important. And, and enforcement is the only key, the only key we have. So I, I think enforcement first, 
Second is, 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 is making sure that a reality check is put in, and that is that they're not putting the cars in front, uh, that they're not going to get four spots in front uh, of the house, that the greenery that these new houses have should have greenery. Uh, they quickly take them down. Well, the enforcement should be pretty simple because the evidence is there. You have a house with five mailboxes, mm -hmm. a two-family house with five garbage cans outside at night. Now, the clues are there. You just got to pick up on them. Right. Reservoir, go ahead, Mike, real quick. The problem is that, do we have a, say, when you say talk about the old candidate, they talk about You're enforcement. Let yeah, let him get You time? can jump yeah. in, Mo. Enforcement, but actually enforcement belongs to the mayor, not the city council. So I don't know if it is a right subject to discuss the enforcement theory, but actually, if we have, a, if we have not enough enforcement, then please, don't blame the council, blame the mayor first. Well, we need more inspectors. How many inspectors do we have citywide? What do we got, like four? No, <laughs> what we have to do, right. no, 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 this is what we have to do. If we have an overgrow weeds in your house, the inspector come from the sanitation. It's an interesting thing that he's talking about inspections because no, 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 I always want uh, no, to, in terms of the inspectors, yeah, and yeah, in terms yeah. of the issues with yeah, so you know, overgrown to, trash a, no, and trash saying. in front of your house, legal, when we had a, a, illegal a Unite for Clean Streets effort. We tried to mention today. So, right, first things cool. one. Cool. So, I just no. wanted to point out that we had the United for Clean Streets effort. We met with the Dar Department of Public Works and we um, asked about their environmental inspection reports, right? And what we found, and this was April uh, 2015, is in that month they had only given out 16 citations, trash violations in the Heights. And if you in the, live in the Heights, you know that there are many, many more trash violations than 16 um, violations of, in the course so, of a month. I can so, our group, time. Yes. so our group sat with DPW and we met with them and they sent us the environmental inspections for every month as we met with them for six months. And we gave them input on what they could do in order to increase those inspections by changing the hours of the city, that the workers were out there, that the inspectors were out there, to actually be at the times when people are putting out their trash. Well, I thought to make sense. Was common, on this. We brought See. common sense in and we increased the inspections to 158. So, oh, that's that's good. Good. and uh, it was because we sat there and we met with them and we worked with them on this one issue. portion of that enforcement. What is the problem in Georgia City? Let's put it this way. If you have old growth weeds in your house, sanitation gives you a ticket. Mm -hmm. Health department will look at it as a mosquito is grow, so they're gonna give a ticket. Housing code enforcement to give a ticket as a violating so and so. So now, one issue, three different departments work. What we have to do, we have to centralize enforcement. That's the only right. one way to we can crack down illegal apart, we crack down uh, violate the sanitation, all other things. All right, let's move on. Yep. We've got about 25 minutes left. Reservoir 3. It, back when Mayor Healy saved it, it was not going to be sold to developers for condominium. Since then, I don't think the city of Jersey City has put so much as a, a bench in Reservoir 3. The county has put money into Res 3. I don't think the city has done anything in Reservoir 3. This is our central park. This is our little piece of greenery. We haven't done a damn thing for at I least the last you. 10 years. Yes, I agree with you. Mo, I'll let you go. I actually don't think that's true. I know that the city actually has put money into maintaining the reservoir. Um, I would agree that we could be doing a lot more, and I think it's a jewel, and then we should be um, you know, doing it, trying to find more funding for it, for sure, and that should be on the list of one of the you know, areas that we invest in in Wait the upcoming years. Wait a minute, we years. just spent like but $18 million dollars on Berry Lane. I can't get a park bench in Res 3. Reservoir 3, we have, we have invested in maintaining it. If we didn't put any investment into that, those buildings would be completely in the ground. Um, we do actually, every year, put in money into the reservoir. We just, just had to maintain board it. up the water tower because it was falling and some kid fell in. We're so not putting no. any money in there. So Pat, yeah. this is what we have to say. Reservoir 3 is a one of the, like there was a past say, will be a central park in Georgia City Heights. And to look at it. A lot of people move to Jersey Heights because of Reservoir 3. You know, from your home, five minutes or ten minutes away, you can fishing, you can kayaking. Mm -hmm. This is the only place you can do that. And you live in an urban area, but you can have a suburb lifestyle you can have in Jersey City Heights. So if anybody interests, come to Jersey City Heights, move to Jersey City Heights. This is the only one place to have. But let me put it this way. As a councilman, 2013, after elect, the first I set up the meeting with the mayor as a group meeting was a Reservoir 3. And the Reservoir 3 already has a plan that costs around the 15 or $16 million to hold master plans costs. And at the time, urgent issue was the water towers. So I spoke with the mayor and the group together, and they allocated $300,000 
to the uh, repairing the, at the water towers, and we allocated $50,000 tree cut in the top of the reservoir tree because the roots come down, break the wall study. That's what it is. But 2018, if I elect, and I'm going to be elect, I'm going to make sure that city of Jersey invest the money to reservoir tree, make a decent park. That's the place going to be make everybody, not only Jersey Heights, we're going to make everybody proud and people who live in Georgia City. Common, what do you think? Read the book. Great. Just get Go ahead, Com. I definitely agree with Michael Young. We definitely fully, we, I support it. We definitely need a park there. It's a beautiful, peaceful area where you can sit. You need trails. You need benches to sit down. And I think it would be beautiful definitely to have a park there. It, it's still an industrial spot. It's an industrial piece of property. We haven't done anything. Rap. It should not be a park. Um, and you mentioned that before, Carmen. Uh, first of all, it has to be preserved. It's a reservoir. It has water in it. There's not room uh, for that kind of thing. And, and not only that, there's a relationship that's going on with the it public schools, a, a STEM search re relationship that is great. Um, the Alliance, the, the Reservoir Alliance uh, and Conservancy, they're doing a great job in doing the nonprofit job, and that money allocated is for that, okay? They need infrastructure in that place. And, and this is how I would do it. First of all, this is in the middle of Ward C and Ward D, so we have to keep that in mind. Re a relationship with Ward C has to be done in order for the reservoir to happen. But I like to put it on a redevelopment plan, and at the same time, Persian Field and Gordon's Park, because there is another thing that they share. They share an underground water basin that's coming down that goes to the Hackensack River. I observed this from the work that I've done as an artist in Gordon Park. Gordon Park needs help, the Persian Field needs help. Why not put it on a redevelopment plan and get the reservoir preserved, okay? Infrastructure, bathrooms and stuff like that put in, okay? And then we can market it and make money to pay for a lot of these things. I really think it should be left alone if no other idea. And I really think it's been, it's, it has been neglected for many years. Okay, but we also have to connect it to the park on Gordon because if you look at it, the water is flowing under and it's going to the Hackensack through Sea Caucus. Well, can I get yeah, jumping, Mo. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, so um, you know, I agree that we need to preserve it and that we should definitely be investing money in the reservoir and that the nonprofit organizations that currently um, attend to it should be given, given them credit. The Reservoir Alliance does an amazing job. Um, we do have a school that works well with a reservoir and they're doing great work there too. What we need is a champion um, for that project. And I will say, Michael Young has not been that champion. I have not heard a peep from him. He has not been on his pulpit talking about the reservoir. He's been spending his time grandstanding about other issues and picking fights with the mayor. And we do have an area that desperately needs attention that you know, I wish he had been a champion for for the last four years. Well, so Mo would say that I tried to say, this, this is very precious time, try to concentrate the policy itself. So let me take this one. When you talk about Reservoir 3 and the Maker Park, I'm going to give you major credit to uh, Reservoir Alliance. There's no question about it. They are the community leaders. They put their time and effort, no question about it. But also, I like to give the credit former Mayor Jeremy Hilly. When he make, when he make a news conference, at the community center person field, when he stand the auditorium, that the first thing he say that this announcement make Mike William gonna be very happy to hear that what I say today. And he say, I'm gonna declare reservoir three as a park. I hope everybody understand and that remember what happened. So it doesn't matter what some person say, Council Mike take try to credit all those things because what she was not there. So I'm gonna make it clear. But people was there, they heard that. They know what I did, what I fight for the people over the 35 years. Put it on record and never lie. And the people live, I'm not going to say that, but it's okay. Because the people know what I've done over the 35 years for Georgia City Heights and Georgia City. All right, from the Jersey City Arts Council. I want to get this question in. We're running out of time. We've got about 15 minutes. Uh, Carmen, how will you support the creative economy in Jersey City, including artists, and organizations, creative businesses, artist workspace, performance spaces, and galleries. I definitely will support them. You'll support them? Yeah. Okay, so we should give them taxpayer money. Yeah, I will support them. Okay. Definitely. 
Michael, support the arts? Yes, it's no question nature. about it. And uh, you know, some people say, Councilman Michael is grandstanding. No, I'm not the grandstanding. Actually, my culture is my country I come from culture, we try to quiet, but I'm gonna tell you now. Because of why? When you talk about art, probably I'm Beautiful. proud of that. If we see the Central Avenue, we bring up the open gallery. The most mural started actually Georgia City Heights and Central Avenue. As a president of that, I support no artist. So we have to be understand we bring up to open gallery and the first time he served Georgia City in the Main Street, Central Avenue. I support whatever they do that, I support because artist group is the number one group to improve the economic and local economic. There's no question about it. So whatever they want to come up with the idea, we got to pay the penny tax for the uh, support the art groups at organization, Georgia City. I support it because it's worse to support it. All right, Rafi. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're an artist, so an artist, yeah. I know where you're going with this, but go ahead. I actually support it, and it's, uh, you know, it's already being done. A lot of good projects that's going around. I think they should be a little bit more overseeing on some of the projects like the, uh, you know, the graffiti uh, painting projects that, that you see by painting these murals. It certainly is a nice thing to look at. Um, it's a lesser priority, although I'm an artist, uh, but I, I've used art my whole life uh, to communicate, and that's what I like to do, using art to communicate. Like I did the totem pole by hand. It took five months to do in Gordon Park. I, I only did that to attract people to the inner park, and that was an easy task to do. But art, how do you get it paid? That's, that's gonna be the trick, and the trick, uh, and the Palisade uh, District, that is a, it's just a foundation for art. Uh, it has to be also very delicate. Uh, let's face it, this is a different area, the Heights. I had art shows, two or three people with the studio art shows. I've been in art studio shows more than 10 times. I had three in the Heights, even had one in Gordon Park, and not many people come to them. Um, it really is downtown. So you'll uptown. support it? I will support it, Mo, yes. Art. Um, yes, I absolutely support the arts and uh, funding for the arts. And I think one of the areas that we could look to is how the state um, is allocating money to the different counties. And we know that in Hudson County, we're getting less than our fair share of funding uh, for the arts. We get much less than other counties throughout New Jersey. And we should definitely be demanding and working with our state partners to show that we have the arts in Jersey City that need to be funded um, through the um, county funding that comes from the state. I think we all should be looking to the city and seeing what we can do on the city level to fund the arts because yes, they're an economic engine. Um, I know the Heights Ward D, we have many, many artists. That they're a great asset to our community. I've been involved in the arts with the Riverview Farmers Market. I started um, a program to bring music to the park um, that was funded through that county funding. Um, and I've also, you know, in the, and then from the Farmers Market also came the Riverview Jazz Festival, um, which has been a great asset to our community as well. So I think that um, I'm absolutely for funding the arts and working with artists. We also need to look at housing for artists as well, live workspaces, um, making sure that we have affordable housing for artists uh, to live in our communities as well. All right, one more question before we get to the closing remarks. The Western Slope. They have talk about making them one-way streets. We spent $25,000 for uh, consultants to look at it. And they suggested that the slope, you know, Terrence, uh, Liberty Avenue, and I believe Columbia should be converted to one way. Mike, you agree? Well. Because as I look at this note, it looks like you don't. Oh, no, 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 no. I agree, disagree, it's not an issue. The people that live in there, the other people decide which way they want to go. They want to go the two way or one way. The people have decided, yes, mayor intention was very good to try to change the lot of two way to one way. But we have to be understand, because of that at the time, uh, 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 the snow and the uh, mayor, I don't know how open he ride on the trucks, go like a uh, shovel the snow, probably close to election time, probably he did that. But look at it. When he goes at the uh, 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 snow, uh, uh, push the snow, they have a two-way, a lot of difficulty, we understand. But also, people live there 365 days a year, they say, yes, we can live with a one difficult day, couple of snow times, but we cannot be difficult, inconvenience, last of the days. Yes, understand. So what they have done, we have called several meetings, I think we have the four or five different public meetings conducted. End of day, people don't want to change, if they change a certain area of western slope, actually block. If it's snow, they cannot get out, they cannot get in. We understand. So not only that, also 
fire trucks, so fire, fire trucks and the police, when they respond, going to make a lot of difficult time to do, respond to that area. So we understand the community don't want it and the people who live in that area don't want it, then I have to support what they be, people believe in that area. Well, so that's on. why Come, I say if no. I, if I could just address that, yeah, because this is the second ahead. time yeah. he spoke we'll about it. We'll make it quick, because we've got to get right, close yeah. the statements. Why, why did you pull the ordinance? <laughs> that would be one question, and yes, you just explained why, all right? But you've wasted a lot of people's times, like myself, because I spoke at one of those meetings, and I think you should be charged for those three days. Because if you like money, if you like numbers, you should be charged for us wasting our time coming after school and going there and speaking on it. And I believe the consensus was that they wanted to change it. If you look at it, you have to change the direction. You could not wait on somebody to give you an eye and let you go under those circumstances when there's eight or nine feet of snow. Okay? All right, let me get mowing here. We got to get the clothing. One-way streets, two-way streets? I mean, I think we have to look at it in terms of if it is a safety issue and that's what's determined by traffic and engineering, and I'm not a traffic engineer, so I'm not going to make that you know, determination, but if it is a safety issue, then it needs to be addressed and there needs to be a clear, um, transparent process. I mean, I think part of the issue is making sure um, that people are aware of the process and what's going to happen at the end of the process. And what I, um, so I just, if, you know, as council person for the Heights, whenever we're making a traffic change or doing um, something to our streets in that kind of way, we need to notify the public how many meetings are going to happen, what's going to happen at the end of the meetings, how this decision making process is going to go, and then stick to that. Because um, people feel when you do go through a process and then nothing happens, that they haven't been heard and the problem hasn't been addressed. So I think this really comes down to transparency and making sure that we are very clear with people about how we're making decisions and actually following through on the things that we say we're going to do. Common? We definitely need to, it has to be a one way, because right now, the way things are, first of all, up there, I live on Terrace Avenue, we need speed bumps, they were, I mean, it's a problem, it's a big issue, and definitely we need to, um, we need a one way, that, I mean, I'm 100% with that one way. Well, so, people from no. the slope, they, I, I think that's a 50-50, but let's, let's move on to our closing, we got some closing we're, remarks, Yeah, right? closing, okay, fine. All right, okay. Raffi, you opened it? Let's close it real fast with the closing remarks. We well, got like six you. minutes, probably, probably seven minutes. Thank Go ahead. I'm a lifelong resident, as I alluded to earlier. Um, I come from downtown, uh, okay? And, and working with Michael uh, for my volunteer hours is a very important thing because volunteer hours to me is just the indication for young and teenagers for programs that I want to come up with as, uh, uh, as the kind of person uh, to do that would be a person who has so many volunteer hours. So I practice what I preach. And in doing so, uh, my father before me, who was a, a deacon at St. Boniface Church downtown and who worked for in Kearney at Western Electric, he taught me very early, uh, of course, we had 11 in our family, uh, what public service means. And when I went into the military, I understood. And nothing could keep me from Jersey City. So I came back here over 30 years in the Heights to practice what I preach. In doing so, uh, I really got a connections to the community. And, and speaking about a whole other diverse uh, things, I really think we need a grassroots person to take care of that. JCResident.com for any information. Grassroots leadership, 7C. You have to vote for me. Thank Mo. you. Uh, hi. So, um, you know, our current council person has had four years to address the trash, the traffic, um, the myriad of issues that we have in our community. And he spent his time instead, you know, picking fights with the mayor and, and grandstanding. And I think that we need a leader uh, who knows how to get things done in our community. And because a lot of these issues weren't being addressed, I did work with the community in a grassroots way to accomplish things with my neighbors um, because things weren't happening in front terms of the trash. Um, because, you know, parking continued to be an issue. So we came together and we worked on those issues. And we were able to get things done. And, you know, Councilperson Michael Young talks about checks and balances. And I think it's extremely important to have checks and balances in government. And, but he only checks. 
he you know, calls question to ideas, but he doesn't bring ideas forward. And I want to be the balance. I think when you are on the council, you have to work with the partners, um, you have the other council people, and you have to work with the mayor. And even if you don't agree with them, um, sometimes you're not all going to be on the same side. There are going to be differences, but you need to be able to bring people together to get things done. And that's what I do. And that's my track record in the neighborhood as a community leader and activist. Um, I've been able to get things done. That's why people have come to me and asked me to um, run for office. And so I'm here, I'm here to stay, and I'm gonna keep on working to make the Jersey City Heights the best neighborhood it can be. Uh, so vote 5C um, on November 7th. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been great. My pleasure, Michael. Well, first things, I'm very lucky. We have a, almost so 50,000 people live in Jersey City Heights and only three people challenged me to my job. So when you look at it, I'm damn lucky for that part of it. But we gotta just look at it this way. The problem what we have is not happen overnight. So because over the years, the elected officer or mayor ignoring, not pay attention. So we try to solve the problem one by one, it takes a lot of time. And actually everybody knows that I open my office in Central Avenue, try to meet the people, every person who live in height, they're at 8.30 in the morning till 7, 8, 9 p.m. in night, Monday through uh, Friday, and the Saturday, I try to take a break because I have a beautiful wife, I gotta spend time with my wife, no question about it, I got personal life, so that we have to do that. And also, a lot of people say, especially in the city hall, city council members, call me, I'm grandstanding. I never grandstanding. When I object to mayor, I have a plan. And the, what is the problem is that they don't have to be compromised with the, prob, the idea I suggest because they got six or seven solar vote. That's why this election is very important. If you want to make a government, transparency, accountability, today's transparency government is the only mayor only can see. Accountability, if we have connections to the mayor's office, even though you do the, you do the wrong things, they try to cover it up. That's true. We always know that the newspaper. But I try to fight for every issue can protect the taxpayer of your city. I continue to do that. Even though they call me, I'm grandstanding, I never gonna afraid to grandstand for the people of Georgia City and the people of Georgia City High. Take my word. I have 34 years experience as community leader. Probably other candidates don't know what I did because when I involved that, they don't involve that those issue. I proud of what I done for the people of Georgia City. I continue to do that. So don't forget, November 7th, this is the time we started the protect of Georgia City height and Georgia City, and I'm gonna bring back what we have here, the height of pride. Thank you. Common. As a Jersey City resident for 17 years, I served as a committee person for two years. I was president of the Jersey City Puerto Rican Parade the last two years, 2015 and 16. I'm here to serve the community. I'm here to work with the community, and we're about the community, serving the people, helping the people, and definitely, as you see, I'm good. I've been working with the community for years, years, years. This is nothing new, and I'm here to serve my community. Come vote out November 7th, 2017. Please come and vote 1C, Carmen Vega, Team Mr. Kudis, 2017. Well, that wraps up our debate for Ward D. One of these four candidates will be your next councilman, whether it's Rafael Torres, Mo Kinberg, the incumbent, Michael Yoon, Carmen Vega, make sure you vote. December 7th, no, no, excuse me, November 7th, make sure you get out and there's more than just the council. You got county elections, you got state elections, you got the governor. We have a lot we have to vote. Try to make an informed decision next Friday. This Friday coming up, we'll have the Ward A council debates. The General McCann, the former mayor, is going to be the moderator of the, those debates again. Each one of these candidates are well deserving of your vote. Take the time, Google them, go to their websites. Two of them are running with the, uh, the big tickets. That would be Carmen Vega's work, running with Bill Massacutis for mayor. Mo Kinberg is running with Fulop, uh, Team 2017. Michael is an independent, the same thing with Raphael, Raphael, Raphael Torres. That wraps up tonight. Make sure you get out and vote. Vote for someone. I'm Pat Amelia. I'll talk to you Thursday on the Hudson County Show. Good night. <laughs>